We're live. We're live. Hello to everybody out there. We're going to give uh, everybody a few minutes before and to let people kind of hop on. Awesome. That yeah. was great. Uh, also, guys, everybody who's in the uh, the message board so far, we have a chat. If you look on the side, uh, feel free to post messages or questions throughout the webinar. I will get to them uh, if I'm able uh, while we're live. We also have Justine Boss, our marketing director, who will be kind of checking the chat messages as well. And uh, if we don't get to anything during the webinar itself, we will make sure to respond to you um, afterwards. And you can always email me, K Miller, like the beer, K Miller at hotgrips.com and uh, with any questions as well. Awesome. This is so exciting. I don't really do live things. It's kind of nerve I felt I felt myself sweating last time. It's it's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> there's, there's a reason like on my like Instagram stories, like I never do live stuff because it feels a little big brother and a little creepy. Yeah, it, it's I almost don't know where to look. Yeah, like my camera's up here. And then yours might be over here or I, I'd like to look at the screen, but then it looks like I'm looking down. Um, yeah. It's yeah, so, strange. and like nothing has changed. I'm still by myself, well, with my wiener dog in my room, and yet <laughs> all these people with me. It's really creepy. It's kind of creepy the whole concept. Oh, look, we have somebody first chiming in. Hi, Laura. How do I see the chats? Okay, or, so look, not look to your. Oh, the somebody loves your silver hair, just like I do. Thank you. The silver thing is like in now. I don't have enough hair to really do anything with. Although the person at the dollar store, yes, I shop at the dollar store when I need to, uh, mm -hmm. calls me calls me rogue. And I think it's because of this. Uh, I love this streak, it's so cool. Thank you, it's my way of spicing life up. I'm a new mom and I'm married, so. <laughs> I think it's super spicy, I like it. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> Winning. Let's see. Oh. Okay, yeah, so I can't see messages, just so you know. Or okay, if so if you're looking at your computer, let me see, this is my right hand, my mustache hand, and look to your right. Yes. And you see a little box with three dots in it? Yes. Click it. Okay. Does it pop? It just says all messages are public. <laughs> and enable chat, which I've done. Yes. There you go. Okay. So then you might get a message now. I'll show you. Thank you to everyone who's here. We'll start in probably about one more minute. We have 25 people signed up, 17 people that have actually joined us. And um, I know punctuation is uh, punctuation, punctuality. Punctuation is important too. Punctuation is also important. <laughs> yeah, inflection. But uh, okay. yes, we'll give people just maybe another minute just to sign in. All right, I just wrote a message. Do you see it? Um, I don't. Justine, moderator, maybe help with that one. I know. It's okay. You just have to tell me if messages come through, so I can't see anything. I'm female. I can multitask. I have a lot of ADD, so if people are typing stuff, I'll be, like, focused on that, and I will, I'll just stop talking. So it's probably actually for the best. In fact, right? I told Justine to please help me out with it. She's uh, <laughs> she's the moderator. You can't see her in here, but she's watching. I just um, see. See? Big brother. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, so she's gonna she's gonna help with the messages as well because I will do the same thing. I'll just sit here and read. I have my I, I'm allowed to have caffeine this morning. Oh, nice. Yeah, my I, keto iced coffee. Um, I it took all of my effort to not pour a glass of wine for this. So, but trust me, I thought about it. Oh no, you can have wine. <laughs> I was like, I don't care, but no, I'll hold off. <laughs> oh, no, if people people who do know you and your your LinkedIn posts, they'll expect the wine. And actually, uh, Phil Page. Wine on Wednesday. You know Phil Page, you know, obviously. I just uh, he just asked for a good wine recommendation for scallops. Ooh, for scallops. Oh, you want something? You know what is amazing? Um, it's called um, Ludi. Um, uh, L E. And then the second word is D I E T ish. I think that's how it is. I'll send you a pic, Phil. Um, it's awesome because it's from the ocean. It's from Oregon. I think it's from Oregon or Northern California, but it's got tons of salinity to it and it goes awesome with oysters. So. 
I love this. See, uh, I was pregnant and now I'm breastfeeding. So I have to like limit ah. still. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Um, I love my dog. I didn't mean to have that reaction. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I was pregnant on breastfeeding. I'm like, oh. Uh -uh. <laughs> I'm We're so off to a great start today. That was really uh, inappropriate. No, that's it just was because I'm imagining 12 months without wine, which is what made that face. Not oh, no. Oh, no, honey. It's like 24 months without wine. <laughs> Oh my gosh, sorry. It's even worse, yeah. So I let myself have once in a while, like Memorial Day, I'll have some. You know, you have to pump and dump for all of you guys out there listening, yeah. sorry. We'll get started on the real stuff in a minute. Um, but I, I watch your LinkedIn because I'm like, oh, what's new to try? What can I, what should I fill my one cup with? My wine down Wednesday. I know, it's wine down Wednesday. Wine Wednesday at the local bar, yep. Yeah. Honey, we should go there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to get started. I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. They're usually about a half an hour. But if we go over it, we go over a few minutes. This isn't like a deadline. This is just comfortable. Hi, Ryan. I see you, Michael. Oh, we have a lot of questions. OK, so first, let's take five minutes for people who don't know you. I can't imagine anybody who doesn't. But for anybody that may not know who you are or what you are, uh, why don't you just take the next few minutes to, to kind of say hello? Hi, yes, I'm Sue Falsoni. I uh, am from Buffalo, New York. Um, I'm a physical therapist, athletic trainer, strength coach, um, somebody I want to be. And now I can add the title author to my Yay! That's very cool. Yes, I'm very excited. I'll show you. I actually have a copy. Very handy. Bridging the gap. We have to performance. It just came out last week or two in the last week or two. And um, so, yeah, we can talk more about that, too. But I'm really excited. That'd be great. We actually had somebody pop on uh, that wants to know real quick if it's going to be available in ebook or audiobook as well. It is. It's definitely an ebook. So um, you can either go to on target publications or on Amazon and it's in Kindle and it's on an ebook and the whole thing. So definitely. Um, are you for people who have any questions for you? Do you want them to contact me and then contact you or can they contact you directly? Uh, yeah, either one. People can um, people are can totally contact me. That's not a problem. Um, I do get behind in emails, as everybody does. It's email is such a blessing and a curse. But um, yeah, people can totally contact me. It's great. Cool. All right. Um, so we have a first question before we dive into the really cool stuff, the the eye stem and whatnot. Um, how did you? How was your first season in MLB, and how did you work your way into baseball? That is a really good question. I was wondering the same. Yeah. Um, well, I was working with Athletes Performance at the time, and um, this was back in 2008. So, oh my gosh, 10 years ago, which is unbelievable uh, that it's been 10 years of this craziness. Um, but I was working with Athletes Performance and the Dodgers had approached us uh, to help them with some solutions for um, their performance and their rehabs. And so it just kind of became... I don't know, my account for, I guess, a lack of a better word. And it was just sort of um, a relationship that I managed. And then um, it grew over time. So um, what started off as a consulting gig with uh, with the team sort of turned into a September call up and then it turned into a part time and it turned into 120 games. And then I took a year off to sort of go back and um, focus athletes performance, was making me a vice president at the time. So I, I had to choose in 2011. And um, I chose athletes performance. So I went back and to athletes performance and obviously stayed in touch with the Dodgers and stayed in touch with those people. And then um, they had called at the end of the 2011 and said, Hey, we want to make you head athlete trainer. And so I did that for a couple of years. So it was really um, kind of a combination of right place at the right time, uh, a really organically growing relationship. Um, definitely not something I ever sort of sought out. Um, like most things in my life, I tend to take a different path. And so, um, just being really, was really open to something new and something different. And, uh, it sort of grew into what it did, which, um, was their head athletic trainer for a little bit. So I spent six wonderful years with the team and, um, met some amazing people, had some great experiences and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. Very cool. Um, so at, within that story, is that when you came across ISTIM or how did you how did you come across that form of treatment as either a PT and or ATC? Gosh, um, when I first learned about the utilization of instrument assisted stuff was probably 2000. Let's see, I started working for Athletes Performance in 01 
And I think I met Don Chu in 2002. And he was doing um, instrument assisted techniques. And he's really the one that introduced me to it. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, 16, 15 years ago. Um, And so, you know, Don is just a huge, huge mentor of mine. He is really one of the people that I look up to, like one of my biggest things was I never wanted to choose, right? Like most places make you choose. Are you an athletic trainer? Are you a physical therapist? Or are you a strength coach? And I don't ever want to choose like. Cause you're all of the above. Yeah. I'm all of the above. Right. And so a lot of jobs, unfortunately make you choose which one you want to be. And so that's why I loved athletes performance was because Mark Verstegen, who's the owner of it. Um, he never made me choose. He just allowed me to be the professional that I was within the team that I was within. And so, um, Don is really like one of the groundbreaking people who function same thing. I mean, he's the godfather of plyometrics, I dare say. Um, so tons of performance training stuff. He's a physical therapist, an athletic trainer. And so he was really someone that I looked up to. Um, so when he started talking to me about instrument assisted stuff, I'm like, I'll look into whatever you tell me to. <laughs> like I just, I really respected him and what he, what he was doing as a clinician. So, um, so yeah, he's, he's really the one who got me into it. Very cool. Um, I have a question or there's a question, Michael, uh, what is the best way you improve internal rotation with ISTEM? It's very specific. Yeah. <laughs> very, very specific. I know, right? Well, when, because we're dealing with throwers, right? A lot of times we need to restore their range of motion. And so, um, you know, there's so much debate as far as the whole GERD thing, right? And like, what's really causing it? Is it, is it capsular? Is it muscular? Is it you know, retroversion? Like, is this a bony thing that we're not going to change? Do we want to change it? Is it necessary in order to throw baseball? Right? So there's all of these sort of different theories. And so my biggest thing with restoring internal rotation, especially with a thrower, is always normalizing them back to their baseline. So I do a ton of treatment if they'll let me, right? Sometimes at the level that I work at, they are locked into their pre and post game and there is no changing that. Um, But if they'll let me to really focus on that stuff post game in order to try to restore. So really with instrument assistance stuff, whether it's pre game or post game, you know, ideally we work on that entire posterior chain. I'm someone who's really, really adamant, obviously, about making sure I address the thoracic spine with it too. So when we're utilizing um, instrument assisted stuff, definitely making sure I'm hitting thoracic paraspinals, making sure I'm hitting that entire posterior cuff, and then also opening the anterior side too. I think sometimes we think, you know, people are lacking internal rotation, so we have to address only posterior structures. I think it's really important to address the anterior structures because so many times those things pull us forward that we alter the humeral head in the glenoid. And so all of a sudden that humeral head is sitting forward. Now all of a sudden we don't have great joint in order to restore that range of motion. So I think it's really important that we're addressing both anterior and posterior structures. I think that's where sometimes people get locked up is they just think, oh, they're lacking internal rotation, let me stretch posteriorly. And that's not really the case. We gotta centrate that humeral head. Very, very well said. I think um, coming from like a physical therapy side, I've seen it in outpatient clinics every day where people will either chase the pain or chase the site or the the site of the dysfunction rather than going along the kinetic chains. Thomas Myers, the anatomy trains comes to mind. Um, Treating along those, of course, is going to be a lot more effective. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, So I know you do a lot of dry needling. Now here in California, I can't really speak to any of that because we're not allowed to do uh, some of those really cool things. Very tumultuous topic. <laughs> yes, yes, tell me about it. I work for the CPTA, so I see it all the time. Yeah. Um, but can you offer us some insight on, or even demonstrate, that would be really cool, uh, yeah. how you use dry needling with ISTIN in conjunction for anything in general, or just give us some kind of insight? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, oddly enough, I have needles with me everywhere. Um, So yeah, so needling is is really interesting to me. um, And I definitely utilize it. Oh, and I open the package and it's empty because I've already used it. (laughs) All right, let me find something else. Uh, um, Let's see. But your hair looks great. So that's okay, great. Um, so yeah, so, uh, needling is, is really interesting. And I, I mean, I can just needle myself, um, and I'm not going to use gloves because I'm needling myself. So, uh, but normally, obviously with patients, I would use gloves. So these are a sarin type needle and there's tons of different needles out there, but basically, um, you know, you have this needle in a tube and then basically what you do is you put the tube on someone and then you click this little thing and then you tap the needle in. And so I don't know, maybe you can kind of see the handle on my shirt there. 
Um, and then it just really depends. I mean, all I'm in right now is the epidural layer. And so when you start to look at the research with needling, um, superficial, there's two different types of needling, superficial needling and deep needling. Superficial needling, you're just in the epidural layer, which is that's all I'm in, right? This is, a, I don't know how long this needle is. It is a 30 millimeter needle. I maybe am in two or three millimeters just from the tap. So I'm just in the epidural layer. And so there's plenty of research that shows superficial needling um, is effective, especially for pain relief in the short term. Deep needling has been shown to have a little bit longer term um, improvements in patient reported outcomes, including pain uh, and function. So that's why we like to use the deepest needle we possibly can or safely can, I should say, but really just superficial needling can be really affected because we're just in the epidural layer there. Um, and I should not be moving around while I have needles in me, but um, what we think, one of the reasons we think that it helps is that we're altering the sensory input. And so even just being in that epidural layer with just a couple millimeters, I think one thing that's really important to note is that, um, uh, one thing that's important to note is that Oftentimes, like we spend so much time trying to change people's motor output, when really, if we just change the sensory input, we're going to automatically change the motor output. So right away, by putting a needle in someone, even in the epidural layer, we've totally altered their sensory input, or we're changing, or we're stimulating sensory system, which means we can potentially alter their motor output. So that's one reason I like it. And then if you want to go a bit deeper, that's fine. I just got a little twitch on myself, which is uh, not necessary, but um, certainly can happen. And so um, I've got my little red box handy as usual. Uh, but yeah, so then what you can do is you can utilize the needle in order to stimulate epidural tissue, fascia, muscle, um, tendon, ligament, periosteal pecking from, from a bone standpoint. Um, so there's a lot of different structures that we can we can needle. Um, and so I, needling is just an important part of my practice because it has such an effect on the nervous system as well as the biomechanical things that it can affect. And then it works really, really well with all my other treatments. So whether I'm using cupping or instrument assisted or manual therapy or exercise, whatever it may be, it works, it just complements nicely because you're again affecting that nervous system, which is the whole point of most of what we do. So here's, here's that's really cool because I honestly, I don't know much about other than why you would do it. I've never really seen it done again, being in California. Uh, we don't like go to an acupuncturist if I need something like that. You yeah. know, unfortunately. Not unfortunately, I don't mean it that way, but I wish that sure, the no, physical absolutely. therapy field and we could do that here. Um, so if, if you have somebody that, and I know that people are treated on an individual basis, you know, patient-centered treatment, but if you have somebody that's coming in that needs the dry needs, the dry needling is appropriate for dry needling and is also appropriate for eye stem, how would you, um, in a very general way, how would you put those treatments together? Is there a specific yeah. order that you go in? Knowing yeah. that you can't move, we're not supposed to move with the the, the needles, obviously. Being a, a passive recipient from the eye stem is probably important, right. unless you're doing needles here and eye stem here. How would you go about that better generally, just so if people are interested in how you combine that? Yeah, absolutely. And that that is what really, like, is important to me in our curriculum and our dry needling curriculum for structure and function is that our first class, our foundations class is the motor skill class. That's where you learn how to needle. But then our advanced class, our lumbo pelvic hip class, our specialty classes that we have is how do you utilize this modality within everything else that you're doing, right? Because I think it's important to note, no one modality is perfect for everybody, yeah. right? Exactly. It's really hard on how we combine these things in order to create best patient outcome measures, best patient outcomes. So the way I have found personally and I there's right we're trying to figure out what instrument assisted does we're trying to figure out what dry needling does and so there's really no research on combining these two modalities so all I can offer is a scientific explanation and foundation for what I do and clinical pearl right so for my clinical pearl based on scientific theory is that I'm gonna always needle first because what I find is that when I needle somebody Let's say if I if I needle someone's in, like going back to our internal rotation thing, right? If I put a couple needles in somebody's shoulder, if their in, internal rotation is whatever you want to call it, like we'll say ten degrees, right? And then I put a few needles in someone, and now all of a sudden they have thirty degrees of internal rotation, right? After just putting a couple needles in, leaving it in for a few minutes, taking it out, I've gained twenty degrees of internal rotation. One of two things has happened: I've either used magical needles, or it wasn't a biomechanical tissue length 
issue, right? So right. one of two things, needles are magic or it wasn't what I thought it was. So when I see those huge changes in range of motion, it, it was a neurological thing, right? Because all I've done is messed with the nervous system. I got an immediate gigantic change in my range of motion. And now I know I have a nervous system issue that I need to maybe abandon my manual therapy and go right to therapeutic exercise and teach the patient how to utilize this new range of motion. If I put needles in people and they get a few degrees of range of motion or I've decreased their pain, but we haven't had this huge gigantic range of motion. Okay, great. Now I think on top of this potential neurological issue and pain issue, I also have a biomechanical limitation. And that's where I pull. That's when I then go to my instrument assisted stuff to see if I can um, improve more blood flow to the area, if I can help um, work some of the um, some of the scar or, or whatever the reason I'm utilizing instrument assisted with, um, I go to that, right? And so so that's how I utilize the two together is I, I tend to needle first, see what happens. If it's a magic result, I, I need to I need to exercise, I need to move. If it's not a magical result, I've got to address the biomechanical limitation that may be present. Maybe that's a capsular thing, maybe that's a muscle thing, maybe that's a fascial thing. Um, and I that's when I go to my instrument assisted. If you ever find a magical needles, let me know and I'll move out of California and, and be trained on these magical needles. <laughs> I think this could be big. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. We have um, another, another question. How does, it's another kind of cross intervention um, question. I stem with cupping. Now I know you have experience with a lot of different modalities and we all know, like you said, that modalities aren't a one size fits all. Some people think ultrasound, for example, is a hoax. And other people swear by it and nothing else. Don't touch me. Just put the ultrasound on me and let me go. Right. Um, but how how does cupping, how do you use cupping with ice I've, I've seen yeah. them done simultaneously. I've seen them done before and after, like you were describing with the, the dry needling. Um, what do you find works best in general? I'm in my home office. So all of these things are like on my floor right now. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. So here's what I'm going to do. Hang on. I'll be right back. Um, okay, and now my dog is, uh, I like your chair. Your chair is very pretty. Oh, thank you very much. And there's my wiener dog down there. Hello. And you said his name is, uh, is Richard, 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 and he has his own Instagram, Richard, the wiener dog. (laughs) Um, (laughs) all right. I'm going to try to cut myself here, which is going to be a bit difficult. Let me balance. I'm impressed. Okay, here we go. All right, so with the cupping, right? So what we do is, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get this off. I like that one. Mine is not as nice as that. Thank you. We're gonna give this one more shot here. Okay, so right, as I kind of do this whole cupping thing, what I can do, I've got three different techniques that I do, um, but the way I combine it with instrument assisted, you can do one of two things. Okay, it's not gonna necessarily work, but you guys could see how it was lifting the tissue up. Right. And so there's a lot of different theories, which could be a whole webinar in and of itself on cupping, on why cupping works and how the different techniques that I use cupping with um, work. But as it relates to instrument assisted, I'm going to offer one theory. So you guys could see right as I have the cup on me, how it's lifting the tissue up. Right. Versus let me see. Okay, I've got my new favorite toy. My hot grip pro. pro. Yeah, I took that on my honeymoon to Europe with me. <laughs> Seriously, the because I travel, my practice is on the road, so it's really tough for me to carry a full set um, all the time. So I am loving this little guy because he comes with me everywhere, and it offers me a lot of different things. So, but anyway, anyway, so as I'm as I'm using this tool, right? So now as I'm going, we see now I'm compressing the tissue, right? So there's those are the two different things. This lifts the tissue. This compresses the tissue. Is it, is it better or worse? I don't know. And there's not a research study to tell us if it's better or worse. But what I do think is, is it's different. And so when we begin to look at principles of periodization, right, the body likes periodization. And so whether we're talking about microcycles, macrocycles, mesocycles, um, in season, off season, upper body, lower body, pushing, pulling, our diet, right, we vary everything. The body responds to variability. If you introduce the exact same stimulus into the body all the time, it eventually stops adapting. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin to think about our manual therapy, right? Like I can kill an athlete with a foam roll, right? Like, hey, great to see you today, grab a foam roll. 
You know, oh, you just came off the field. Awesome. Grab a foam roll. <laughs> oh, it's an off day. We're going to foam roll. Right. And then like if I want to get really crazy, I'll schedule a massage for them or I'll use a massage stick or I'll use instrument assisted stuff. Right. It's all compressive. Mm -hmm. And so what cupping does for the first time gives us something that is decompressive. And so for me, I use these tools to periodize my soft tissue. Maybe Monday and Monday I do cupping. Tuesday I'll do instrument assisted. Wednesday I do the magical art of leaving them alone, which I think in sports medicine we can way over treat our athletes and our patients because they're with us 12 hours a day at times. Um, and then again, Thursday, maybe I cup. Friday, maybe I instrument assist. Again, Saturday, maybe I leave them alone. Sunday, they get in the pool and I let them do more pool work, right? And so those are sort of my ideal things. So the way, like, I think you can use these two things at the same time. So I know people who like put a cup on someone and then they will, I don't know how to do this, but then they will like, you know what I mean? Like put the cup on someone and then like, like work it away and then move the cup to a different spot and then work away from it. And, and I think that's cool to sort of combine the two modalities together. What it really does for you, I'm not exactly sure. But for me, in my personal practice, whether you discard all the circulatory theories and all of the theories about what decompression is or changes in tissue stiffness, right? There's tons of theories out there as far as what cupping does. If the only way you use cupping is to sort of periodize your instrument assisted work, I think that's a really cool way to combine the two modalities. So that's- you know, I, have, I have never even, like I'm mind blown because I I've, I've never even <laughs> thought of, of, you know, obviously I've, I've never worked to your level with athletes, but I, but I think periodization, we're all pretty familiar with that. I've never even thought about applying that to soft tissue work. Like that's a really, really cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I've been using it. I've been getting some really, really good results. So that way I'm just not always doing the same thing, right? I don't do anything else with my athletes every single day, right? I don't do the same exercises. I don't do the same exact manual therapy, but yet we'll always do the same soft tissue. For, so for me, I've really been conscious of trying to do these different stimuluses because um, I, I think the body reacts better that way. Well, yeah, and I mean, science shows that that's how the body reacts and adapts. Why not apply it to, to soft tissue work? Right. But it's kind of why hasn't that been analyzed before? Right? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> very, very cool. We have a couple other questions that came in. We'll try to blow through them. I know we're kind of nearing towards the scheduled end of the, the webinar. Um, let's see. He's double checking on my dog to make sure he's chewing his bone. <laughs> What's up, Richard? Mine are, my poor babies are in the, the garage. They uh, last year, last year, I keep saying last year, last uh, week they made a lot of noise. They're, they're very large lab rescues. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you ever do, let's see, uh, can you do dry needling in combination with Eastim? Yeah. When and why? Okay, this is a very loaded question, Sean. And also we have a question about wine with Big Macs um, for Frank. When you okay. Whichever question you want to answer first. All right. Well, wine with a Big Mac, you're going to want like a good, like I think, I know that, right? Like I'm such a wino. Um, I, I, you want something big and bold and peppery. Yes. So to me, like a really nice Syrah or a really great earthy cab goes really well with an amazing hamburger or cheeseburger. Um, so that would be my recommendation for that. Uh, and I'm learning wine. So yeah, I, that's definitely my, an area of study right now. So hopefully I'm getting some good recommendations. But those are sort of what I'm liking with those things right now. Yeah, I would think something red, obviously, with the burger. Yeah, so. and something peppery to sort of bring out the like the, the smokiness of the meat. So, yeah, I would go with like a nice Syrah. There you um, go. There you go, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> Mike um, is literally barking at himself in the mirror. Can you see him? That's fantastic. He's, he's, Hi. Playing, he's playing with himself in the mirror. It's so funny. He's so I, funny. I wish, you know, I, I wish I could entertain myself like that as well. <laughs> I know. He's the so dog's cute. life. Um, so we'll take uh, okay. needling one more question. In. Yep. Needling and Easton, you definitely can combine. So we have, I don't know where my little Easton unit is right now, but basically you get these little alligator clips and you attach it onto the needle. And so what that does is it makes the electrical stimulation transmit right to where your needle is. So the, yeah, so a couple, it's super cool. So there's a couple of things with this. Number one is we no longer have to overcome skin impedance, which means your electricity goes exactly where your needle is. So this whole 
let me grab surface electrodes and put them further apart or closer together and see if I can estimate. No, if I want to get down to the hamstring to where the scar tissue is, right, I can take that needle and go, oh, because no matter how hard I press into the tissue, I always have to get over the tissue that's on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with the needle, boom, I go right down to where the scar is, where I want to be. I attach my e-stim to it. Now my e-stim goes directly there. I don't have to overcome skin impedance. I know exactly where the electricity is going. So I can utilize the, the principles of mechanotransduction to help allow the body to convert the electrical energy into a mechanical stimulus into a chemical energy to change what's happening at the tissue level. So that's number one there. Number two, um, it can help from a huge, from a pain standpoint. So there's a ton of research on the use of e-stim with needles and how it can help stimulate the endogenous opioid system. And so I'm a part of a, a, a group called Safer Pain Relief, um, which you can look that up at saferpainrelief.org. And so for us, it's all about how can we try to intervene with different types of alternative safer pain relief, right? Because um, uh, obviously the opioid um, um, issue is is large in this country, right? And we're, we're trying to figure out how can we prevent people from getting into this chronic pain state. And because once they're in a chronic pain state, it's really, really difficult, right? That's why some of our other modalities like BioFree or kinesiology tape don't always work on people with chronic pain because they're processing this thing so differently. So the things like gait theory and condition pain modulation theory, like those things don't work on people who are in chronic pain, right? You have to tap into their opioid system, which is why opioid works really, really well for people who are in these chronic pain states. And so research is really showing us that when we attach east into the needle, what, like we can we can tap into the endogenous opioid system and the serotonogenic descending pain pathways um, and really, really deal with pain at a really, really cool level. Oh, and I'm just jealous. I need to get out of California. Not only is it expensive <laughs> in here, I can't do crap. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty it's a pretty cool modality. And again, like anything, right? One modality is not for everybody. Yeah. Um, and it's the way you combine it with your manual therapy and your instrument assisted and your exercise and your tape and your posture, right? And all of these other things, like there's, there's no one modality for everybody, but it really is, it, it can be really powerful when you be, begin combining these things. I mean, combination therapy is great. I mean, when I first started doing combination therapy, it was two modalities. It was, uh, the, the typical, uh, ultrasound and e-stim and, uh, my dog is crying and I have to just let him out. <laughs> it's okay. We don't anymore. I can seriously talk to you forever. I'm looking at this thing and it's one thirty. But uh, anyways, combination therapy is fantastic. I, I've used. Um, we have a topic that we'll talk about sometime later. But Tekra and uh, the iStim or iStim with eStim. If that makes sense. Yeah. I've seen amazing no, I results with that. I haven't tap tapped into that. That's oh, it's awesome to me as well. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's um, definitely, definitely a cool concept. Um, yeah. I, I tried it on myself before, before anything, because I was too nervous to put it on a patient <laughs> first. And I, cause I have a STEM unit here, a little, you know, tens unit, but, um, for any kind of injuries that I've had, I mean, I've had surgeries up the wazoo on my knees, on my hips, I have labral tears in my hips right now. And it, it really, even just for the pain relief, not the musculoskeletal dysfunction. Yep. Very, very effective. Yep. Um, we have, two questions and maybe hopefully we can kind of combine them into one as we wrap up. Thank you guys for all listening to our banter, by the way. Oh, so much. This is my first live webinar. Let's do it again. This is yeah. fun. <laughs> oh, it's fun. Um, let's see. What is your advice for PTs who want to learn more about uh, coaching techniques and a best way to uh -huh, bridge the gap? Ooh, oh my gosh. You can totally buy my book. I recommend it. I got myself, I was on the waiting list, but I didn't get a notification that it was out. So I'm going to buy it today. Oh, no. Yes, it is. It's out. Um, Perfect. Yeah. You know, it's, it's such a big topic, right? And I'm actually, so next week I'm doing a webinar, my time, because it's such a huge topic, right? Like, um, you, I think for me as a physical therapist, when I started working at Athletes Performance, the thing I learned very quickly was that the more I hung out with strength coaches, the better clinician I became, right? I think sometimes... Um, we as clinicians can kind of think like, oh, well, we maybe have some of the most quote unquote formal education in the room. Well, that doesn't mean you understand performance, right? And so when I first started working in the performance realm, I was like, well, they can do three sets of 10 of a step up. They're good to go. They're discharged from therapy. Uh, okay, well, that doesn't mean that they can 
stand on the offensive line and hit another human who's 300 pounds, right? Like that doesn't, that doesn't equate, right? So what I really learned in those early days working with athletes performance was truly bridging that gap from rehab to performance. Like I had to understand concepts like acceleration, absolute speed, multi-directional movement, what those things meant, what foundationally did the athlete need from a joint standpoint? And then how could I build on top of that? And then I had to get out of my comfort zone of three sets of 10, right? I love three sets of 10. <laughs> athlete moves, right? Yeah. I had to learn how to load and coach, because that's another thing I think as a, as a clinician, I didn't really understand. How do you coach six sets of one? Right. Like you need to understand how to coach power and you need to how to understand how to load and manipulate variables um, like speed. And so that's the type of stuff that I learned from hanging out with the strength coaches. And as soon as I started paying attention to what they were doing, I became a way better clinician and bridged the gap between rehab and performance way better. And so, I mean, that's what I built my career off of really is sort of living in that space. And um, that's why I'm so excited about the book, right? It was two years of insanity. Um, and so it's, it's so good to be out and it's just the beginning, right? Like there's going to be a lot of education that comes with it because I think, I think clinicians answering coaches alike are craving for that, right? I think that clinicians are looking to understand the performance realm and strength coaches are having injured people walk into their gyms because their insurance is running out. And so we're just living in this day and age where we don't have to practice outside of our scope, but we have to be able to communicate. We have to be able to help um, our patient and for, in their best interest, right? We've got to yeah. leave our letters at the door. Yeah, and insurance, I mean, don't even get me started on insurance. Know, right? a whole other I, I, they just, uh, yeah, they they think, you know, maybe meet, uh, meeting that minimum, you know, that range of motion minimum, is, is the same as function, is the same as performance, and it's really not. So taking all of those concepts into consideration when you're treating a patient, I mean, is, is really, really important. So I'm glad that you guys kind of are going after that, and I'm excited to get the book. Thanks. I didn't get a notification. I was so upset. <laughs> um, we have one more. We'll do one more question. Um, can you buy the Well, this isn't a question. Can you buy the book on Amazon? That's you can. Question. Yes. 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 Yes, Sean, yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so one and last question. If you don't like it, don't leave a review. But if you like it, then leave it. <laughs> we'll remove it if you don't yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. No, I will constructive criticism as well. It's very important, yes. Um, last one, guys, and then we're going to sign off. Thank you guys for staying on late. Um, very much appreciate your time. And, and we'll get Sue back. Uh, I know she's a very busy woman, but um, I'd love to get you back sometime so we can just talk more about anything and everything. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what are your thoughts on anecdotal evidence? Um, such as your variation of soft tissue treatment on a day-to-day -day basis versus what research might say about how frequently you use soft tissue mobilization, ISTEM or other. Yeah. That's loaded. So No, I think that's a great question. I, I love that question, right? And I think that it, it like just brings me to the topic of, of evidence-based practice in general. I think what we've done is we have taken the concept of evidence-based practice and equated it to, I need to have a research study that tells me what to do. And that was never the point of evidence-based practice. When you really look at the root of evidence-based practice and what it is, it is equal to the best available research, clinician experience, and patient values. And all three of those things are equal, right? And in the center where those three things meet, best available evidence, best um, or clinician experience, and patient values, in the center is evidence-based practice. And we have mistakenly taken that to mean if there's not a research study that shows what I'm going to do, then you're not practicing evidence-based medicine. And that's false. So we have to remember the research is one third of what evidence-based practice is. So my personal experience, right? I've been a clinician for 22 years. That means something in evidence-based practice, right? And so you know, my N of one, right? If I do a technique and then my athlete at the end of the night bypasses the physician and doesn't take an Ambien tonight to go to bed, that's an N of awesome one, right? And I'll take it. If that's one athlete who ends up skipping his Ambien dose because of the recovery techniques that we did that day, like for me, that's huge. So I, I again, I think we have to look at the evidence. Um, I think it's important to note for most things at this stage, you can find a research study that supports your opinion, whatever it may be. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> right. And so we can throw back research studies to support our opinions all day long. Back and forth. Um, 
So it, it, we have very little evidence. We have very little proof for most things. Um, and so we have to just keep that in mind. And we have to look at the evidence. We have to look at the research in order to guide us. But we have to remember our experiences and our patient values are just as important in the evidence-based practice model. Very, very, very cool. I'm stoked. I literally could keep talking to you, but I know that we're now 40 minutes in. So um, I'll say it a third, fourth, fifth time, however many times I've said it to all of you guys. Thank you so much for your questions. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, and Michael, yeah, no problem for squeezing questions in. We would love to answer every single person's question. So if you if you have any other questions, concerns, again, you can email me. You can contact Sue. We posted your LinkedIn uh, okay. link, link, LinkedIn okay. link on here so people can follow you. And uh, we will be sure to get you back on yeah, here. That'd be great. And if um, if people, you, I can follow the hashtag for a while too. If, is it Hawk Talk Live? Justine, <laughs> are you still here? So if, if people post questions and use the hashtag, I can kind of follow the hashtag and answer stuff uh, on Twitter or whatever. Yes, awesome. Um, we'll put. I'll have Justine uh, post that in here. The the hashtag, and I'll send it to you as well. Um, for those of you who are. Uh, who are still in here? If you do share this webinar and you and you hashtag it with uh, the information on the slides that will pop up in just a second, um, you will send you a shirt. We're we're glad that you guys joined us, and I'm wearing one example right now of the shirt. I'm just I'm just short as hell, so you can't see anything. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting on a pillow to get this high in the chair. So. That's awesome. Yeah, um, but we're also going to pick. Hey, there we go. We're also going to pick. Uh, a winner from whoever's still still on with us, um, you'll get a, 20, a full 25% off any any purchase, any tool um, of your choice. So wow, awesome. Uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be doing different giveaways each week. Um, and we're just so glad that you guys you guys are joining us on this, uh, this little Hot Grips Live journey of ours. And Sue, thank you so much again for joining us. I'm going to I'm going to let you and, and Richard have some time together so you can grab that glass of wine. Thank you. I know it is almost two o'clock. It's time for wine. <laughs> five o'clock somewhere. I'm a parrot head, so I fully believe Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's East Coast happy hour. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right, guys. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Signing off.